good. Yeah. And now we need to do did you Oh maybe that's that. Yeah, that's what we did here with the hunter thing. Yeah, we should do now. Right, right, right. Um so this is working, wonderful. Good. Um we need um so the way it's gonna go is one for each of us because we need some natural to work in the light green. <laughs> Will be interested by me if you have a quota. Okay. Um, and then I will give a challenge to the people in the world who live here that I would like to give to you, mm -hmm. but I have just one people. Okay, no thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will give one of you, they will give me the two of you, and two of the other two shamans will go on a line and uh, a minute a month on the undercut. Okay. And then it starts from that moment turn that I have done the undercut challenge and we will give to you um, well on the screen in the in the audience and on the live stream okay <laughs> okay and what about questions are there questions after this okay and yeah. how should they be handled um, the uh, Delta and Kula will be in the in the room okay <laughs> once your presentation is finished um, I mean I'm gonna say that or wait to see it uh, we'll switch on their mic and then you can hear them. Okay. And uh, Lua will be moderating the questions, so we start with the questions. And Ilga will also be receiving questions from the online and, and on chat audience. And she'll just read them for you. Okay, good. And then it's it over at 11, correct? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. So just one question. Could you leave um, this room open? Yes, I'll do that. if you could tune in just to give like let's say five minutes beforehand and we'll see Mariko and she'll be ready okay sounds good sure mm -hmm. well thanks thank you sure thank you thank you okay <laughs> bye bye bye
answer in the chat. I just wanted to confirm something with you so we, I know if um, we can take a look at that. yesterday but I forgot when I was speaking to your colleagues about planning this event um, um, a couple months ago we had asked for a count of 30 to 40 minutes mine yeah. about 30 36 is that still okay yes that's still okay, okay. yeah okay yep. all right I'll try to make sure you six minute mark is it okay okay and then that might mean that there's 10 minutes rather than 15 for questions that's fine okay, okay. all right thank you thanks so much okay, thanks bye bye thank you <laughs> Hi everyone, please take your seats, because we're live streaming, we're going to start at Even though people are still coming in, I hope they do it quietly.
Thank you, Michelle. Um, welcome, everybody, to US There There. My name is Lua Volaj. I'm a curator here at Strom, and I would like to warm, well, welcome everyone that is physically with us here in the space in The Hague today. Uh, my name is Ilga Mignon. Welcome, everybody, here. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our online audience. Uh, we have turned our space into a TV studio with a live audience. We're very happy to be back uh, in real life. But as you will understand throughout the event today, we are calling this a hybrid event. So very warm, warm welcome to wherever you are. Um, Uncertainty Seminars is a series of events that explores the potential in a more constructive way of being uncertain and of our time being in drastic flux, never knowing what comes next, and also the precarity and all the systems that might be crumbling or becoming fluid underneath. How can we lean into uncertainty and the not yet and doubt and hesitation as a critical, curious strategy to create more value, work together in a more productive way? This is the series that we do. Um, we have chosen for this particular time. Miss there, there from the starting point of the Mercato projection. Mercato projection is the most common depiction of the globe. On the Mercato projection, the map of the world is flattened into a linear grid, deforming the sizes of continents. Greenland appears about the same size as the whole continent of Africa, when in actuality it's about 14 times as small. Um, how come that this way of representing the world is so common, its presence so seemingly unchallenged in our daily life? Feminist cartographies, open source imaging, and speculative mapping can challenge these rational instrumental representations and contribute to seeing the world differently. <laughs> this program, of course, also comes at a time in which bridging distances through technology has exponentially increased the kilometers that our voices and our virtual presence can travel in a single day is like totally expanded. In 2020, we had 13% more meetings uh, than the year before. And in this edition of Uncertainty Seminars, we try and sort of also pick at that, like unnormalize the infrastructures through which all of these distances are being bridged, right? Um, so we're very honored to have some contrib contributors with us today and some contribu contributions from a distance um, that use unusual methods of bridging physical, figurative, and metaphorical distances. Open Weather will show us how to use your body to make an open source satellite image. Shannon Matten will talk about maps that display a lack rather than a presence. Uh, Alina Benjaminson, who is with us here today, and Elias Kimayo will address the distances and violences of carbon offsetting. Tabita Rezer's video work alludes to the roots of the internet cables and the ocean, uh, so the infrastructures of like all this distance that we're bridging. And finally, we will end with a new performance by Claudio Rietveld. Um, and then I ha just have some housekeeping things to share. Uh, the live broadcast of this event will be shared on the YouTube afterwards, uh, minus the two videos we'll be showing here. Uh, so you only have this weekend if you're watching online to see those, and then we will cut them out, unfortunately. Um, we are also joined here today physically by Naomi Moonlion, who you see there. <laughs> Our photographer. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you would prefer for your image not to be shared in any of our communications, just let us know so we can take that into account. Um, and it's also good to know that none of the images of the audiences will be shared to the live broadcast today. Exactly. Just some, some backs of heads. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, another dimension of our online space uh, that we're bridging with you is the chat. So if you're watching online, you can send us your questions or your comments. Um, I don't know, great links or otherwise, uh, maybe locations, GPS locations where you are. Very curious who's watching. Um, so the chat will be moderated by me during some Q&As. And of course, our audience here can also chip in with some questions after some presentations. Everybody uh, on board with that? Yeah. Uh, that brings us to our first program. Great. Thank you, Ilha. Open Weather. Um, Open Weather is a collaboration, artistic collaboration 
that describes itself as an experiment in imaging and imagining the Earth and its weather systems. It was founded by Sophie Dyer and Sasha Engelmann uh, last year in April 2020. And they make how-to guides, critical frameworks, and public workshops on the reception of satellite images using free or inexpensive amateur radio technologies. We're going to be watching the very short video Satellite Seance, uh, which is a documentation of a performance done by Sasha Engelmann. Um, and it documents an experiment performed by her at a listening station operated by GCHQ, which is the UK intelligence service in Cornwall. And it shows Sasha positioning her body to decode an image produced by a polar orbiting satellite. Enjoy the program. Thank you. NOAA 19, an orbiting weather satellite, crests the horizon at the cliffs near the town of Bude in Cornwall. Tracing an arc from north to south at 800 kilometers in altitude, NOAA 19's radio transmission enters the electromagnetic territory of one of the largest surveillance stations on Earth. The sound of this transmission carries an image of distant, opaque bodies, past and present events, currents of light and shadow. In the 19th century, female clairvoyants described psychic visits to distant lands. The practices of these women and their network of psychic connectivity was compared to the electric telegraph. The psychics provided a live feed, a form of surveillance. Yet this live information feed, seemingly controlled by male operators, was easily disrupted. The clairvoyant network created new maps, a counter geography born of the magnetic state. Perhaps they also sent transmissions of political affinity, reaching across space times a spectral inheritance to which we might listen. Our next contributor and the first live talk of this event is by Shannon Mattern. Uh, we're thrilled to be able to have a contribution by her as she's quite busy and I see that she's already zooming in. Uh, Shannon is a professor of anthropology at the New School in New York. Uh, the USA. She's uh, interested in archives, libraries and other media space and media 
spaces and media infrastructures. Uh, in this talk, uh, How to Map Nothing, she takes us on a deep dive into the networks and systems of welfare and surveillance under the geographies of suspension during our global pandemic. So the flip side of this doing nothing that we have all kind of been um, uh, obliged to do. So I will just briefly check in. Uh, Shannon, are you there? Can you hear us all right? Yes. I am here. And yes, I can hear you. Yep. All right. Well, Shannon, you are now live on our screens. Uh, so happy to have you. I think the floor is yours. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, thank you very much for having me. I was asked a couple months ago to reprise a project I did earlier this year, so I'm I'm happy to revisit that with you here today. So just one moment while I get set up. Okay. If you don't see a full screen slide, please let me know. Otherwise, I will get started. So two years ago, or a century ago in phenomenological and political time, artist and writer Jenny O'Dell published to great acclaim a book about, well, nothing. And how to do nothing, she made the case for retreat or refusal as an act of resistance to capitalist productivity and commodified attention. She laid out a plan for, quote, holding an open contemplative space against the pressures of habit, familiarity, and distraction that constantly threatened to close it. End quote. Yet not even a year later, after the book's release, retreat was imposed on the world in the form of social distancing and lockdowns, and many, sorry, and many people found themselves to be doing a whole lot of involuntary nothing. No going out to eat, no going on to away to vacation, no parties or weddings, no soul cycle classes, no moving into the dorms for freshman year, no properly mourning the dead, and for millions of folks, no jobs. Yet all those losses cleared the way for new discoveries. As many life coaches, economists, and futurists opined that last year, the COVID-19 pandemic occasioned a great pause, a fertile suspension that opened bountiful space and time for great for deeper wakeness, or excuse me, wakefulness. We saw such wakefulness evidenced in the contemplation of community and then justice, the creation of mutual aid networks, the resurgence of movement for Black Lives uprisings, and the adoption of new hobbies that allowed for mindful domestic practice and sharing. Sourdough baking, oops, my thing isn't, there it is, it wasn't advancing. Sourdough baking, birding, gardening, knitting, sea shantying, and masterpiece jury rigging. Instagram posts and TikTok videos documented these shifts in attention. Major news outlets chronicled the quieting of city streets and deceleration of urban rhythms, while the Atlantic's City Lab solicited vernac sorry, excuse me, vernacular maps in which readers oriented themselves within their shrunken but sensorially enriched spheres of existence. Such contemplative practice has undoubtedly been therapeutic, psychologically essential for many people as they've grappled with the year's tumult and trauma, nothing as an escape from the too muchness of it all. Of course, the pursuit of retreat and technological disconnection has a long history in various religious traditions and cultural, spiritual, and artistic movements. The Zen Buddhists, the Luddites, the Transcendentalists, the Amish, the countercultural communes of the 60s, the digital detoxers of today. Yet according to art critic Kyle Cheka, the current Great Pause marks an apotheosis of a distinctive 21st century anti-Renaissance. He argued uh, earlier this year in a deep, what not, not exactly a slightly problematic article to me from the New York Times Magazine, that the pandemic merely accelerated a years-long descent into negation and sensory deprivation, a desire for nothingness that embodied the exhaustion of optimism and um, the embrace of nihilism. I should note that I outlined this talk before the, uh, his article was published, so it was just a coincidence that they kind of emerged at the same time. Alongside so much tragedy and despair, he writes, mass quarantine has represented a final fulfillment of the pursuit of nothingness, particularly for the privileged classes who could adapt to it in such relative comfort, ensconced in minimalist luxury, kept alive with food deliveries, entertained by streaming services, sculpted by Peloton. Cheka's portfolio suggests that he's primed to find minimalism wherever he looks, even amidst a doubleheader pandemic insurrection. His is an aesthetic nothingness, the appearance of asceticism, the stylized performance of retreat. 
There we go. Kinfolking, um, urban lumberjacking, upstating, confirmation bias allows us to find manifestations of this abstinent influence too in our social media and design magazines. But perhaps even imposed austerity in the form of poverty and hunger could be mistaken for minimalism when we're aiming merely to catalog its aesthetic effects. When we looked at our own windows, even if only through the news feeds on our screens, we witnessed not only suspension, but also decline and then a much greater scale. Maps and graphs showed stilled air traffic and transit systems, depressed economies, shuttered businesses and sheltered, sheltering communities. Those downward trending graphs were of course juxtaposed with rising curves and ever reddening maps indexing the spread of coronavirus infections and deaths up or down, more or less, were we cocooning or incarcerated, standing still or regressing. It was often difficult to distinguish between progress, stasis, or regress. In one of his characteristically profound Zen Cohen's, then President Donald Trump reported to the press his own May 21st, 2020 COVID-19 test results. And I tested very positively in it. I'm realizing now that I forgot to share my sound, so you probably can't even hear that, but it was a, a parody of his own inability to distinguish between positive and negative test results. Uh, this is the same man who wanted to decrease the rate of testing, which would artificially suppress the infection counts and thereby flatten the curve, thus improving the United States global standing, higher esteem for lower numbers. His reasoning exemplified the street light effect in reverse. If you don't turn on the light, you don't see what you don't wanna see, or you see the nothing you want. Social media, mainstream news, and an explosion of Substack newsletters often painted pictures of cities quelled and hibernating, in some ways diminished, and of urbanites either turned inward towards self-betterment or outwards toward their country homes or, or communities. But empirical evidence, the, lo the look of retreat was only half the story. Sorry. Um, undergirding these geographies of suspension were networks in furious motion, continual overstimulation, and exhaustive exertion. I think of my doctor and many like her who sold her family apartment, sent her husband and children to live with her in-laws, and moved alone into a tiny studio a block away from the hospital. Sure, she's living the life of sacrifice and asceticism at home, but only because her work days were a maelstrom of sickness and heartache and crushing responsibility. Consider also the quotidian geographies of the delivery and sanitation workers. There are but a few nodes among many systems of social welfare and management that have historically functioned off the map, either in social, either in informal economies or through proprietary infrastructures. We have plenty of maps and data visualizations that trace the macro scale public health and political eco economic forces that pre precipitated the great pause, but relatively little to show for all the quiet and clandestine agents that made it possible, all the something anchoring and abetting that nothing, all the pulsing activity powering the pause. So in what follows, I'll examine how maps and other forms of indexical spatial data and technologized modes of perception and planning have registered the ambiguities, contradictions, and inequalities inherent in this geography of suspension, an ostensible pause that instead merely extends and in many ways exacerbates the injustices of our society and the inadequacies, inadequacies excuse me, of our ways of thinking about and modeling city life. So for obvious reasons, cartographers and information managers of other varieties have typically had trouble manifesting nothing. Archivists, for instance, have been so busy processing, describing, and preserving their records and their care that they've historically paid relatively little attention to what's not there, all the silences and absences in their collection. Or they've reported to regimes that have actively excluded and erased particular voices with the aim of transforming those subjects into his historiographic nothings. Only recently have archivists and theorists and artists of the archive grappled with means of acknowledging and manifesting the gaps in their collections. <clears throat> New processing and visualization tools, often using machine learning, have aided these efforts. Gabrielle Pereira and Bruno Morshi propose that AI is particularly well suited for such self-reflexive analysis because it offers an untrained eye that reveals in the inner workings of the system its tacit operating logics and ideologies. 
Even the tool's glitches, they argue, can prove generative in suggesting new modes of reading or looking, which themselves embody different ways of knowing and different values. We could draw inspiration from the work that Tim Schratt and his colleagues have been doing over the past decade to highlight the whiteness, excuse me, the whiteness of Australian um, archival collections. Or from the Officer of Creative Research and Elevator Repair Services 2015 work with the Museum of Modern Art um, with their metadata. Their performance of this data amplified the overrepresentation of white males in the collection. We might be able to deploy new technologies in registering the presence of figures who've historically been marginalized. Gabrielle Foreman and Labanya Mukherjee describe how text mining or social network analysis might help to account for and redress the haunting imprints and outright absences of Black women in the archives. Catherine Nicole Coleman proposes that the Carnegie Museum of Art and Frank Ratchie's Studio for Creative Inquiries work with the museum's Teeny Harris photo archive, documenting the work of a prominent Black Pittsburgh photojournalist, could offer a benchmark against which to test the biases of training data sets. And I know that a lot of institutions in um, the Netherlands, including especially the Rijksmuseum, have been doing a lot with data and artificial intelligence. Cartographers, meanwhile, have been grappling with their own epistemological barons. Medieval and Renaissance map makers famously demarcated the edges of the known world with mythical sea creatures that embody the limits of explorers and map makers knowledge. As Chet Van Duster argues, those monsters represented a variety of epistemological orientations. They served as interfaces between the known and the unknown, possible portals to discovery. They were manifestations of a horror vacui, a fear of empty spaces and their marginal position pushed out to a safe distance on the edge of the map, perhaps even relegating these Freudian monsters to the subconscious. While an unmarked terrain might cultivate disorientation and the disease of unknowing, emptiness is also marshaled as a political tool, as with manifest destiny. If it's empty, why not take it? Postcolonial literary scholar Isabel Hoffmeyer reminds us that the myth of the empty sea, too, is largely a product of, the, of European imperialisms and their map-making traditions in which the sea becomes a blank space across which power can be projected. We might draw a parallel to our contemporary minimalist country home, country house living rooms. What kind of power move is it to live in a Miesian glass box? <clears throat> In the late 18th century, Jean-Baptiste Bourguignon d'Avanil, my French is terrible, please excuse me, marshaled the blank for a different, marshaled the blank for a different purpose. Known for conducting meticulous research through correspondence and the study of thousands of other maps, he broke from his predecessor's predilection toward filling in the gaps. His vast blank spaces marked what was not yet known, but they were proof of the exactitude of all that was filled in. Let's look to a contemporary example to consider the epistemologically, sorry, the epistemological and ontological implications of how one chooses to. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Shannon, can you hear us? I think um, we we lost you on the image, but and the sound, and the sound as well. Can you yes. see me now and hear me? Yes. Okay. So I just had to disconnect my external monitor. Apparently it stopped working. So sorry about that. So I should just pick up where I left off. Is that okay?
so I not I hope this is the right slide for where I am in the paper. So architect and urbanist Paolo Tavares explains satellite based surveys have revealed hundreds of pre Columbian geoglyphs in the region. This is probably where I should be. This is in the Amazon. Because these structures had long been imperceptible on the ground, shrouded by forest vegetation, officials were able to claim the land as terra nullius um, that could be uh, rationally domesticated, planned, and re-engineered as a, as a whole. Deforestation programs of the 1970s and 80s were drawn, were driven by what Brazilian Truth Commission calls a politics of erasure of indigenous peoples. Yet, as in the archives, new evidentiary technologies and techniques, including remote sensing and forensic fossil seed analysis, are revealing the forest topographically hidden and politically erased scripts and structures. They're demonstrating how, in the words of ecologist William Ballet, the forest constitutes a vast archaeological archive. That seemingly pristine terrain and expanse of ostensibly nothing is instead, Tavares writes, the product of long-term and complex interactions, I think I'm one slide ahead, interactions between human collectives, environmental forces, and the agency of other species. Still more recently, we've noted the erasure of particular populations from our pandemic maps and data sets. While in the United States, Black and Indigenous communities have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, a fact clearly demonstrable in infection and death counts, cities, counties, and states were often underrepresenting or omitting racial data, which made it all but impossible to map out systemic effects. The Data for Black Lives movement tracked these disparities, called upon states to make race data public, and sought to supplement the standard data sets with additional information, including personal testimonials from Black healthcare workers, the kind of qualitative data that doesn't readily lend itself to representation on a map or data visualization. Sociologist Whitney Pirtle described the nexus of factors that contributed to the overrepresentation of Black death in Detroit. She writes, Racism and capitalism mutually construct harmful social conditions that fundamentally shape COVID-19 disease inequities because they shape multiple diseases that interact with COVID-19 to influence poor health outcomes. They affect disease outcomes through increasing multiple risk factors for poor people of color, including racial residential segregation, homelessness, and medical bias, and so on. So just try operationalizing all those variables, let alone mapping their entanglements. Um, maybe somebody has done this, but I haven't really seen it done well. We also have to consider the possibility that such omissions are a conscious choice on behalf of the excluded population. In her study of the Mohawks struggle for political sovereignty, anthropolo anthropologist Audra Simpson theorizes various forms of refusal, the refusal to recognize others or to be recognized, the refusal to cede or to retreat when that, that recognition doesn't come, the refusal to participate or consent, the refusal to reveal particular privileged knowledge and, and so forth. Unlike resistance, <clears throat> refusal decenters the state and traditional forms of authority and hierarchy. Without these conventional political structures to push against, one needs to draw a new map. Simpson thus refers to her method as a cartography of refusal that traces overlapping terrains of colonization, elimination, and settlement. The contested boundaries of states and reservations and clans, the contours of community membership and the social networks formed within those communities. That cartography itself could refuse to reveal protected and sacred information, as many indigenous maps and cultural collections do. The past year has encompassed multiple forms of refusal, representing a variety of political orientations. Most visible and egregious, of course, have been conspiracy theorists and extremists' refusals to accept election results or heed public health recommendations. The refusal, or we might say resistance, since it positions itself against the state, has generated telegenic and meme-worthy representation, white supremacist, sure. white supremacist sure. insignias and Confederate flags, sure. marshaled to defend their rights to congregate. Shannon, can you hear well it? Can I stop you for yeah. a second? Um, sure. Your screen share stopped working, I think, with Paolo Tavares. Mm, okay. Let me stop sharing. Sorry about this. We tested it before. You know, yeah, no worries. This this happens when you're like bridging distances like these. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, there we are. Thank you. 
Okay. I'll let you know. All right. um, I'll let you know if it stops again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I'll just pick up here. So Ruha Benjamin then um, acknowledges that even the choice to concede, sorry, to consent, to refuse refusal has dis disparate repercussions for different demographic groups. You may be wearing a mask for safety and solidarity, she writes, but your blackness may still be a threat. Black people are not only trying to survive the pandemic, but also the everyday racism of a sick society. In fact, we may endanger ourselves by acting in solidarity with everyone else. So this is about refusing to refuse. In a quarantine condition meant to separate and restrict movement, different bodies hold different rights of refusal and retreat. Unmasked white faces can storm the, conf the federal capital and enjoy free passage. In the eyes of some authorities, nothing happened on January 6th at Washington, D.C., while masked faces of color peacefully protesting their own precarity can get shot. We've also observed frictions between politically imbalanced community strategies of resistance. As some North American urbanites engaged in what indigenous scholar Kelsey Leonard calls entitled escapism, fleeing their uh, cramped apartments for more spacious country homes, trading compaction and contagion for a bountiful space and fertile suspension, some sovereign indigenous nations refused to allow uh, these settler migrants populations to pass unimpeded through their territories. Leonard explains that checkpoints are a line of defense against COVID-19 for many indigenous nations who lack the resources and medical capacity to respond to an outbreak, a vestige of colonialism and failed government policies, or promises that is. Biometric sensors and instruments that block such instruments Rubber bullets, travel bans, and compulsory quarantine hotels are among the other tools and techniques used to draw lines in our contemporary cartography of refusal and exclusion. Yet those same tools and strategies for restriction have also often revealed the porosity of our borders and the interconnections of our sovereign spatial units. The pandemic has demonstrated how these legacies of racism and colonialism and patterns of iniquity continue to infuse our urban ecologies and how those ecologies extend well beyond the city's limits. Let's consider some of those dispatches from the great pause. What if we took each sourdough selfie, each Zoom class, each Peloton ride, each Netflix binge, each map and mapped the ecology of resources and services that made it possible and which when lacking, make such losses impossible or such luxuries that is impossible for other segments of the population. Our ever lane austerity, our lo-fi authenticity, and seamless connectivity are the products of vast networks of connection. Yet the perceived suspension of quarantine, like the horror vacui or that uh, of the sea or the terra nullius of the wilderness, tends to obfuscate all the vectors converging in our homes and in our neighborhoods. The high-speed internet connections that bring us preschool classes and podcasts, and this conference. The libraries that provide connectivity to the millions of people who are invisible to internet service providers. The data centers storing our data. The underpaid non-unionized workers who deliver our pad tie and toilet paper. The healthcare workers and the va vaccine researchers attending to our bodies. The civil servants issuing unemployment checks and payment protection program loans. The freight pilots and truck drivers who deliver masks and wet wipes to our drugstores and who are now cut up in the vast supply chain problems the sanitation workers who whisk away those disposables, and the future waste management experts who will eventually have to deal with the mountains of polypropylene uh, refuse in our, in our prophylactic survival techniques have generated. We can easily overlook the rush of activity that enables our retreat, the other precarity that ensures our security, the tangle of pulsing urban, regional, national, and global socio-technical networks that make possible our local stasis unless we are ourselves a node within those essential systems, or unless we experience the, rep the repercussions of their breakdowns. It might seem that anyone who could disregard all this labor and expertise and affective engagement and see nothingness is alarmingly self-absorbed or willfully oblivious. But we have to acknowledge that essential systems are often designed to fade into the background. And I understand that some of your either pre other presenters will talk about these things. I and others have written elsewhere about why, particularly in the West and the global North, our public infrastructures 
and networks of maintenance and care are often rendered invisible. A lack of valorization and a long history of underfunding such services, the increasing prevalence of black boxed automated technologies that defy comprehension and repair, and a tendency to prioritize innovation over upkeep all contribute to the obscurity of these essential but often uncharismatic systems. Over the past few years, however, partly as a rebuke to the techno fetishism, obscene wealth, and disproportionate power of Silicon Valley, we've seen a growth of interest in, in, in infrastructure and respend and maintenance, with scholars, activists, artists, and designers all striving to call attention to these vital resources. And the pandemic certainly brought them into relief for the general population by pushing those systems to the breaking point. We were suddenly made aware again of the deficiencies and injustices inherent in our logistical, law enforcement, and healthcare systems. And again, we see it today with the supply chain uh, breakdown. A retreat into nothingness was a luxury reserved for those who enjoyed seamless access and reliable care. Those with top tier health insurance and Amazon Prime accounts and maybe second homes to escape to when things got hairy in a city. What's the value of ensuring broader recognition of those entangled systems? of helping the fortunate recognize that their retreat, their fertile suspension, their great pause was actually devastating turmoil for millions of other people. What's the use of pushing urban planners and administrators to appreciate that cities are complex biopolitical and socio-technical ecologies and that their various moving parts are best thought in tandem and in connection to larger regional and international networks? Of course, most urban managers and designers recognize this but our modes of representation, partly as approaches, partly as embodied in isolated infrastructural scorecards and, and control centers, as we see here, tend to reify atomized conceptions of the city and approaches to planning. We have to recognize, as, we, as Whitney Pirtle reminded us, that the overrepresentation of things like Black Death and other overdetermined phenomena are not things we can unpack on a COVID-19 dashboard. Instead, it's a product of variables that we might be able to map interactively, as well as other factors, qualitative, embedded in and extending far beyond the local community, deeply rooted in culture and history, things that don't lend themselves to quantification or geolocation. We have to recognize that quarantine is contingent upon internet connectivity and teacher training and intellectual property policies and digital literacy and labor rights and supply chains and access to mental health services. How do we map what's on the flip side of the dashboard or the Zoom screen? All the pulsing yet precarious systems that make suspension possible for those who can afford to retreat and that function simultaneously as yet um, and that function simultaneously as volatile yet vital lifelines for those we rely upon to keep the systems running. Well, we have to map across scales, linking quantitative and qualitative data generated through a variety of methods and with a range of tools, surveillance cameras and thermal sensors alongside on the ground contact tracing and ethnographic inquiry. Critical race, gender and trans scholars remind us to account for the biases built into these technologies operations and the injustices that have historically characterized their deployment. And while we work carefully with the data generated by these new technologies of perception, or given their rampant misuse, choose not to gather data by such means, we can also look to the work of various designers and cartographers who have developed methods for thinking and mapping across systems and scales. Consider Claire Lister, who maps logistical systems. Mason White, who examines the Canadian Arctic in terms of its resources, trade, topography, colonial legacies, indigenous affairs, and sovereignty. Pierre Belanger, who maps landscape in relation to colonial, military, and extractive geographies. And André Jacques and Ivan, and, and, um, Ivan, sorry, Ivan Manuera's Transscalar Scalar Architecture of COVID-19, a project that, when it was released in April, indexed in real time how the pandemic has reshaped our world, our ways of perceiving it, and how we inhabit it. Several decades of work in feminist geography also teach us how to trace informal networks of exchange and care, how to take into consideration embodied and emotional aspects of urban experience, how to attend to social differences and intersectional identities, and how to recognize the limitations of GIS-based cartography itself. 
In a recent State of the Field review, Mar Mariana Pavlovskia notes that feminist GIS community, um, commonly incorporates variables like access to childcare or domestic services or solidarity economies that are typically of disproportionate concern to women and in a pandemic are of critical importance to everyone. In accordance with the basic principles of feminist epistemology, feminist GIS emphasizes collaborative cartography in which those represented on the map contribute to their own cartographic representation. And it combines quantitative data with spatial data derived from other sources, in-depth interviews, participant observation, photographs, diaries, sketch maps, ethnographic fieldwork, and so forth. Using activity, uh, di using activity diaries created by her research collaborators, Maple Kwan has mapped daily space-time paths of women from different demographic sectors in order to better understand the relationships between their mobility, their access to city resources, and their employment status. Such body mapping, she finds, better accommodates the considerable spatial variations in women's accessibility patterns and the fact that their daily motion is less, less likely to be tied to a single fixed reference point, either the home or the office. It also, I would add, allows researchers and planners to assess particular affective dimensions of urbanized spatial practices. Embodied mapping could offer insights into desire lines, the paths people carve through the city that might not align with standard transit routes and pedestrian conduits. By developing imaginative methods and by creatively merging quantitative and qualitative and other non-standard spatial data, um, data sets, Pavlovsky explains, feminist geographers construct geographic stories that the official data sources do not and or cannot tell. Once placed within urban space, those crucial spatial practices and experiences become ontologically and politically important, despite being made invisible to standard statistics. Through her work to map global solidarity economies, worker co-ops, co-housing communities, community land trusts, care, um, uh, care work and barter networks, excuse me, barter, not butter, barter networks, credit unions, participatory budgeting, and so forth, Pavlovskia saw how maps can serve as tools for social transformation. They can, quote, produce worlds instead of simply reflecting them. Such hope is drastically needed in a time of global, national, and urban rebuilding. And as we restore or redesign our cities in light of the lessons learned from the pandemic, which we're still in the midst of, obviously, we should still look to the values and principles laid out by generations of feminist geographers and planners and more recently by people like Leslie Kern and her feminist city. Kern advocates that we design for mothers and caretakers as well as commuting businessmen, that we emphasize security and safety, that we create spaces for friendship and community and for being alone together. These interests might have historically been represented by feminist advocates, but again, as the pandemic has shown, they're a benefit to the broader population. And speaking of being of benefit to everybody, critical disability scholars also remind us that rather than universalizing good design principles, that is celebrating the fact that things like curb cuts, for instance, and, um, um, are beneficial for mothers with strollers and homeless folks pushing carts and blind people using canes and folks in wheelchairs, we also have to attend to the specific needs of disabled or the disabled community rather than subsuming or disappearing them into a larger, ostensibly universal public. By framing universal design as a productivity-enhancing feature of, of built environments, Ami Hamre writes, we reduce the critical project of access knowledge, which she calls access knowledge, honoring disabled people's ex expert knowledge about how their bodies function, how they interact with space and what they need, and with whom they need to interact in the world. Uh, we reduce it to a rehabilitation technology for disabled users and an enhancement for non-disabled people. Hamrie leads a project called Mapping Access, a participatory mapping and data visualization project documenting through GIS, photography, film, community conversations, and mapathons. They work to create manifestations of access in the built world. They make visible spatial features and environmental conditions that would most likely be imperceptible to the able-bodied. Typical approaches to accessibility focus on issues of code compliance and checklists of standards, Hamrie writes. 
Mapping Access recognizes users' access knowledge and infuses universal design methods with intersectionality and disability justice to create new standards for inclusive design. Henri also reminds us that our virtually distributed pandemic condition, which some of us regard as a temporary purgatory or a portal to nothingness, is actually a familiar and vibrant experience for disabled people who, she says, have long used remote access as a method for organizing pleasure and kinship. This experience and expertise, too, should be recognized and, and represented in our COVID cartography and in the post-pandemic worlds that we build. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that recognition and representation are yet not universally sought after achievements. As Simpson and myriad indigenous cartographers and cultural heritage workers have shown us, individuals and communities, particularly those in historically marginalized positions, need to reserve the right of refusal to stay off the map, to dwell anonymously. One needn't to have their location tracked and data scraped to be transformed into a cartographic data body or a dashboard data point in order to enjoy a city that respects their dignity. Nothingness, for all its presumed vacuity, is a multifaceted thing. It embodies ways of knowing. It has an ontological agency and politics. It has degrees and dimensions. A map of nothing simultaneously demonstrates that an ex experiential nothingness depends upon a robust ecology of some things to enable its occurrence. And it recognizes the particular representational needs of various cartographic subjects and their potential desires for invisibility, for refusal. To close, let's explore two recent mapping projects that, re that refract these facets of nothingness. First, Feral Atlas is a collaboratively cr created interactive map of the ecological worlds of the Anthropocene and their feral reactions to human intervention. Over a hundred scholars and artists map out the entanglements of agents, including plastic bags, Dutch elm disease, rats, and banana fungicides. Theirs is a sort of anti or feral dashboard that allows deep dives into particular niche topics guided by subject experts, while intentionally and productively overwhelming us with its sheer size and scope. Its graphics, texts, and impressionistic videos aren't meant to provide a bird's eye view or a comprehensive system diagram. Instead, they demonstrate a limited frame, a widgetized scan, a reductionist map, fails to capture the complexity of the Anthropocenic world we're living in. The pandemic is one such feral response to and catalyst for Anthropocenic change. The feral map of the pandemic's agents and vectors, public health, human-animal relations, vaccines, geopolitics, and so forth, sustains the comparatively tame nothingness enjoyed by those spared its ruin. Second and finally, a literal map of the void, a picture of Messier 87, a black hole 50 million light years away. Created in 2019 by a global assemblage of observatories called the Event Horizon Telescope Project, whose name itself hints at a collapse into nothingness, the image required a perceptual instrument as big as the Earth, the collection of petabytes of data, and two years for the processing and visualization of that data. Scientists used a process, used a process sorry, scientists use a process called interferometry to collate the observations from multiple geographically distributed instruments. The following year, scientists imaged another black hole at the center of IRAS 13224-3809 galaxy about a billion light years away by examining the echo, the time delay between emitted X-rays that head directly from the corona into the cosmos and those that encounter the accretion disk, a ring of swirling matter outside the black hole. This second project, the one I'm showing here, well, this is kind of a rendering, an evocation of it, was publicized on January 20th, 2020, just one day before the United States Center for Disease Control confirmed the first case of COVID-19 in the country. Rendering these two voids visible required a global assemblage of instruments and institutions and intelligences. Scientists couldn't look directly at nothing to see something. They had to look and listen around the void, deploying techniques similar to image compositing and echolocation. The same is true of the pandemic's pause, which has its own experiential event horizon. We have to look and listen and feel around it to grasp all that holds it, sustains it, feeds it.
You have to accommodate its component parts frequent refusal for representation, their retreat into imperceptibility. And for nothings of both the domestic and cosmic variety, we have to acknowledge all the countless somethings that make that nothing imaginable. Thank you. Sorry for the tech hiccups in there. I hope it was still all intelligible. Yes, it, it was. It yeah. definitely was. Yes. Um, can you see me as well, Shannon? I see no, the, I the um, you're, I you're see the stream in half. So yeah. I'm uh, somehow a, a disembodied voice, a sort of map of nothing. You are, yes. <laughs> in and of myself. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was just some technical stuff going on here, so I'm sort of trying to pull together a, a, a question off the top of my head, but I want to first of all thank you very much for the super sort of versatile um, talk in which all the ways of mapping nothing was sort of laid out. Um, and I was really thinking with regards to the sort of refusal, uh, the refusal to refuse, uh, or the refusal to be mapped of the um, uh, critical uh, race and gender studies scholar Philomena Esset, who works in the context of, of this country, the Netherlands, um, and the kind of um, columns she's been writing uh, and the things that she's been putting out there, asking for sort of any sort of number on uh, the division of, for instance, women or people of like particular races in the Netherlands, because nothing is actually registered here. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. I have to adjust my camera position. No, you're just sending okay. it to other screens so people can see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talking to someone, but talking to an audience. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, but then when you were referring to this sort of all these amounts of people that are actually needed for a kind of pandemic retreat, you know, like food delivery, healthcare workers, um, the infrastructure of Zoom. I was also maybe wondering to what degree is uh, the mapping of nothing also a question of making labor visible in different ways? Is that something you can do something with? <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, sure. I think that this, um, that was the initial impetus for writing this piece. It was so much talk, especially among privileged populations and often design writers actually celebrating like this new minimalism of the supposed, the great pause, the retreat, which really then, then obviated or pushed off the map, all of the, the background labor that made it possible. Not only the background labor, but the technical infrastructures, the architectures, the logistical systems. So I think finding a way to render those visible, um, or at least talk about them, acknowledge them, is important to recognizing what makes such privileged retreat possible. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, visibility is not an inherent good. It's not everybody's apotheosis. Rent being made visible on the map is not kind of the end goal for everyone. Because as you pointed out, I am not familiar with Philomena's work, but it definitely seems to resonate with some of the work that you know we have indigenous scholars and critical race scholars in the US and elsewhere talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. being rendered visible on a map, particularly the, the standard case study is like a crime map where mm -hmm. communities of color form disproportionate per, disproportionate amounts of the data that are used to train those those algorithms and then are through an unjust criminal justice system then overrepresented on crime maps. Mm -hmm. And then the crime map essentially creates the reality in that those same populations are then over targeted with police activity. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just a cycle of you know overrepresentation, underrepresentation, all in so many unjust ways that either remove people from the map or overrepresent them in ways that does not serve that do not serve them well. So it's this kind of odd tension, isn't it? It's important to metaphorically render things visible to recognize their essential critical contributions to making the world happen and functional, but recognizing also simultaneously the right to refuse to be recognized when it does represent a danger. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think the, the point you made about the, the kind of over-policing of communities with higher crime rates kind of struck toward with me. Uh, because I learned last week that The Hague is in fact the only uh, Dutch city um, where the amount of police stations is based on crime rates rather than the amount of population in each particular mm. area. Um, mm. 
Uh, and the next one is not a question, but I just wanted to refer to when you were talking about the, the kind of infrastructures of care and mutual aids um, that come from feminist geography. Uh, we did this walk as part of the program yesterday um, with some artist contributions, one of which was by Slutty Urbanism, who I hear um, sitting in the, this audience I'm looking at today as well. And I felt like that came very close to sort of approaching some of those methods of like walking through the city mm -hmm. and considering it, the, the, you know, considering the kind of amounts of power uh, that are being exchanged, especially in a city like The Hague, where you can kind of walk from... Uh, you know, the parliament, which is a stone's throw away from here, to the hotel where all the, you know, lobbyists will stay when they enter. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. With that, exactly. Ilha, do you have some questions from the online crew? From our online uh, viewers, we don't have any questions of yet, but I was actually uh, intending to ask maybe the people here present comments or thoughts. We only have maybe time for one question. I don't want to bring the pressure up with that. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm interested in the idea of past not taken. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if uh, my voice could be heard. Can you repeat your question? So um, I'm just aware during lockdown of, mm. um, we have a friend who has um, uh, lots of physical disabilities. That means she has to use a scooter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're from a small town in South Wales yes. where it is completely un, unequipped to be got around on a scooter. Mm -hmm. And I discovered during lockdown that she was free, more free, because she didn't have to only go out on certain days of the week because she knew on other days of the week there would be yeah. deliveries, park closures and ramps and all of those things. But she'd never reported that to anybody. She'd just uh, um, oh, I see. You know, uh, taken it into her life as a, as a system she had to follow. I, I will try to translate this as a comment to mm -hmm. Shannon, mm -hmm. because uh, she's not connected to the sound of our <laughs> audience. So uh, uh, when people with disabilities actually benefit from the, let's say, more quiet uh, streets, um, and more actually advanced for their uh, use of the public space, how, but your friend that you're talking about has never been asked about this. This is also a gap in the data, is that what you mean? Yes, just, just uh, how, do you, how do you log journeys not taken? How do you log journeys not taken? Yeah, that's a beautiful <laughs> question. What oh, that's mean? a great question. Um, I have to think about that a bit more, but you were talking about the fr your friend not being asked about this. I mentioned Ami Hamre's work, Amy Hamre, who runs the, did the critical disability studies and the mapping access. They are actually have been doing for the past several months a project called um, Remote Access Archive, where they're specifically acting, asking to save the disabled community to talk about their experiences of access, inaccess, the way they have kind of fruitful use technologies to cultivate community, where they have been excluded from certain experiences, really how the pandemic and its shape, reshaped conditions have either um, highlighted the fact that they've had to have cons compensatory behaviors for their entire existence or, or kind of universalized practices of remote access that they have used for years or created kind of systems of exclusion or injustice. So I would encourage your colleague or your friend to look up this remote access archive because I know that they're actively seeking for disabled community members to share their stories. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. That's I think wonderful. that also yeah. brings us to the, the end of our little roundup moment because uh, we're on a tight ship and I believe that so is Shannon, who is uh, uh, super busy. I'm so happy uh, that you were joining us today. Uh, regardless of your busy schedule and for everybody else this talk will be online for longer so you can tap back into some of the sources that Shannon shared thank you very much for having thank me you. have a great rest of the conference I'll, I'll tune in to the stream <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> Shannon Matter, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. brings us to uh, in our space here live in The Hague, uh, everybody seated here is uh, having a break. We'll have a 15 minute um, intermission. So can have a drink, find a restroom. Uh, our online audience is uh, served with some great videos that we selected through an open call 
recent graduates and students from the Royal Academy of Arts in The Hague. Um, and the next two program uh, elements, the videos you'll see, if you're watching on YouTube on our live stream, are Christina Lavosi. Uh, the title is, and it seems to me like the end of an era. And second, Petra Eros with Terraforming. So everybody who's not here can watch that on uh, museum nights uh, this evening. Enjoy. Between January and February 2017, the archaeology department of the municipality of The Hague carried out an excavation in Beenkirst land, the large avenue that crosses from end to end the industrial district from which it takes its name, the Beenkirst. Precisely here, a new tunnel in construction, the Rotterdam Seban, will emerge from underground. Digging in this main road, a wooden wagon wheel has come to light. It has been found at the bottom of a well, dated at the turn of the 17th century. It served as a foundation for the bricks casing. Allo stesso modo in cui l'esistenza e il destino di questi due oggetti si sono inevitabilmente intrecciati, così penso che la costruzione del tunnel imporrà un cambiamento radicale nell'identità del Binkhorst. Sarà un nuovo centro della città, uno spazio ibrido di lavoro e abitazione. Una nuova idea di residenti e quindi di vita stanno prendendo forma attorno a questa visione. If I imagine myself having unearthed this wheel from underground, I guess that from there, solidly stuck to the bricks, it would have been suggesting me a significant evidence. At one point of its existence, someone decided it was no longer required to fulfill its natural function of movement. From that moment on, and in that precise space, the act of mobility was not a priority anymore. By fixing it to the well, it has been made sedentary, part of a settled structure with the aim of permanently and constantly provide resources. What happened around this space? Has life changed together with the will? In 1919, a caravan camp was established in Binkerslan, next to the railway and right in front of the building that housed the PTT Central Warehouse, the former Dutch post office. This building is today called Bing 36 and it hosts almost 200 startups and businesses. Back then, the municipal executive, pushed by the Caravan Act of 1919, decided to gather more than 100 families, mostly of Roma and Sinti communities, in this strip of land. A lot of complaints came from the railway and the PTT, which strongly opposed the settlement. In addition to the mobile homes, wooden structures were built and canva tents were set up. In 1925, the caravan camp was dismantled, with a plan to build a new one in Valdorpstrat, in the middle of La Quartier. Mentre scopro tutto questo, un pensiero mi echeggia per la testa e il continuo tentativo di appiattire e inglobare ogni diversa forma di vita a quella più appropriata. Legare la propria esistenza alla mobilità e a una casa senza fondamenta è visto soltanto come una forma indesiderabile di vita. Di questo campo nessuna traccia è rimasta al Binkhorst e forse soltanto nel vicino cimitero di St. Barbara che qualcosa persiste di questo passato. In the collective imagination, the ideas of speed and mobility are embedded in the shape of the wheel, just as those of individual freedom and autonomous movement are commonly connected to cars. È curioso come il luogo in cui la ruota è stata portata alla luce sia probabilmente a pochi passi dal punto in cui il tunnel emergerà per consentire l'accesso alla città con un ritmo tutto nuovo. Il Binkhorst è sempre stato un luogo di transizione, 
uno spazio di passaggio, di mutamento, metamorfosi di un luogo in un altro. Come tale ha regolarmente ospitato insediamenti temporanei e le comunità migranti hanno costituito una presenza costante. Guardando indietro alla storia e al passato recente di questo quartiere industriale, pare abbastanza superfluo spiegarne la ragione. Sembra quasi di vedere ancora i fumi raschiare l'aria e il rumore avvolgere ogni cosa. In 1995, the municipality of The Hague approved the temporary establishment of an asylum seeker center. I find quite curious that this was again in a former PTT office on the bank of the Trekvliet Canal. This project never found an easy ground. On March the 31st, 1994, in the town hall, a Binkhorst residence committee was held to discuss about the disposal of the center and the concerns of the neighbors. Intended to house 600 asylum seekers, the OC, Dutch acronym for Research and Reception Center, was set up for a period of five years. The municipality, being responsible for the provision of an adequate education for the children in the center, decided to build an emergency school. Besides that, a room and a nursery for the women alone were set up as safe and caring spaces in such an alienating process of placement and displacement. Closed around the beginning of 2000, after undergoing several structural changes, the building has been destined to exclusive residential purpose. Renamed Unoblock, it has been provided of a hundred new houses, developed with the idea of the DIY homes. Looking at the future, a well-designed future of the Binkhorst, a fracture in the historical pattern comes out and it looks to me like the end of an era. Pianificare la costruzione di 5.000 nuove case, imporre un modello progettuale così invasivo a una città, significa rifiutare, almeno come ambizione, qualsiasi casualità di un'esistenza transitoria. Significa promuovere uno stile di vita sedentario. E se anche la temporaneità e il transitare faranno ancora parte di questa nuova vita del Binkhorst, e se forse lo saranno soltanto in una forma stabilita, predisposta per soggetti scrupolosamente definiti. There is something more that made of this find an exceptional one at the eyes of the archaeologists. Despite its commonly degradable material, the wheel has been found complete in all its parts. Its joints have not been wrecked by the weight of the stratified earth. But now that it has been eradicated from its natural form of existence, what will its future be? A few steps further from the Unoblock, following the bank of the Treklit and heading to Binkerstland again, there is a plot of land that has been empty for quite a long time. In 2016, The property developer AM completed a project named Global Village. Composed of 30 precast residential units, it's a temporary housing for status holders. Initially meant to host 120 people, this number has been halved to 60 due to the inadequacy of the spaces and materials. In questo territorio squadrato, compresso, confinato e chiuso in se stesso, è facile essere isolati. Non ci sono case accanto, tutto gira intorno al lavoro e la vita reale, insieme a qualsiasi possibilità di integrazione, è distante. This complex will be soon definitely dismantled after a very few years from its opening. All the people that had inhabited it will have to leave. This makes of this global village the last remnant of the past and present identity of this space in transition. 
la sua effimera materialità avrà a quel punto seguito il suo corso. Ma una volta esaurito, che ne sarà dei suoi resti, dei suoi occupanti? L'identità del Binkhorst non sarà preservata sotto una tecca da museo e una volta espulsi, i suoi abitanti saranno ancora divisi, probabilmente lasciati con poche possibilità di integrazione. Mentre tutto intorno al Binkhorst, un confine ideale inizia a elevarsi. Mankind was facing the most profound challenge in human history. The predominant school of thought had led us to believe that an economy without growth was an impossibility, and the only means of achieving development was through economic growth. The old world was dying. The capitalist civilization which had dominated the economic, political, and cultural life on Earth was in the process of decay. The multiplicity of crisis had stripped capitalism naked. It stood more exposed than ever as a system of robbery and exploitation. The limits of nature overwhelmed by its expansion and processes of accumulation, were increasingly evident and its transgression unsustainable. Capitalism lived to suffocate life and drain the living world. Extractivism The process of extracting natural resources from the earth to sell on the world market was being deeply rooted in the hegemonic order of global capitalism. Due to the scale extraction took place, in order to sustain the ever-growing global demand, non-renewable resources had become scarce, while renewable resources were becoming non-renewable. While the apocalyptic sublime of environmental destruction had started to transcend beyond the capacity of human cognition, the single, self-regulating system of Earth, referred as Gaia, had been awoken to protect the preconditions for contemporary life. was polarized into destructive and preservative forces. As the equilibrium had been exponentially destabilized by terraforming, 
Gaia structurally adapted to reinstate balance through evolving the physical and chemical components of the environment. These altered conditions of life solely grants habitability to mutualism, a beneficial formulation of relationship between micro and macrocosms. While eliminates any form of parasitism, the exploitative manner of coexistence. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our next guest. Um, our next guests, I should say. One of us is joining us here. The other one is at a distance, joining us live uh, from his home in Kenya. Uh, Elina Benjaminse is the one that's with us here now. She's an artist living and working in The Hague, and she works with photographic follow the money narratives that combine print, video, and text, creating multimedia installations. Her main concern is how the lack of visuality, which was obviously some of one of the big themes in uh, uh, Shannon's talk just now, um, the lack of visuality of socioeconomic processes affects our ability to engage with them. Her projects are usually born from collaborations with North. So yeah, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you so much to Luan Ilga for inviting us both to, uh, to this really wholesome program. Uh, for me, it's always really exciting to get to present work in uh, in process. I find it always really uh, helpful. Um, and it's also kind of something that has kind of become like, whoa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do we get it back? So, it, so uh, yeah, <laughs> presenting work in process has become uh, something of an integral part of my practice. Um, that said, this is an ongoing uh, research, uh, and so you will notice that there are quite a few uh, narratives and issues woven together, so I hope it will be more or less cohesive. Uh, collaboration is another thing that is <coughs> integral in my process, in all of my projects, and I'm very happy, therefore, that Elias has agreed to uh, be here with us today um, from Eldoret. Um, and I really hope that he can join us in the flesh sometime soon. Do we get my presentation? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Elias will introduce himself more elaborately later, but to give a short introduction, uh, just to repeat a little bit what Lua said, he's a land rights activist and community leader of the Sengbur indigenous group in Kenya, who has come to take an unmissable part in this project in several ways. Most profoundly through that he is lending a narrative voice um, from a perspective that is key for the issues raised in this research. As well as being a companion thinker through her and sometimes also co-producer of the ways the project takes shape both visually and narratively. And I'll pass the word over to him in a few minutes um, after a general introduction on, on the project. Um, so he'll be talking about the ways in which the Sengwe are experiencing um, profound violence spurred by nature conservation and emission market schemes and how these echo colonial rule. So first I will give a kind of epilogue uh, of how the project got started, what spurred the initial motivation, and then I'll try to give a very short and sweet introduction uh, to this obscure thing that is offsetting markets, and then I'll give the word to Elias. And at the end, I will show you how, uh, what stage the project is in at the moment. I'll be reading uh, bits and pieces, and there will always also, of course, be different imagery, um, including variously, very rawishly cut film footage that I'm in the process of working through and that I hope I will be able to expand on uh, once it's more possible. I had a farm in Africa at the foot of the Ngong Hills. So begins the novel Out of Africa by Danish writer Karen Blixen. 
The book is a memoir over years as a coffee farm settler in Kenya through the 1920s and 30s. Not only do I share with Karen that we are both Scandinavian women, but like her, a British project led me to acquire land in Kenya. You see, only some 30 kilometers away from the district southwest from Nairobi that came to be named after the Baroness, that's the Karen district. Some hundreds of acres of land is managed through a firm with offices in London, and on that land many seedlings of trees have been planted in recent years, and one of those trees I paid 11 euros and 25 cents to have planted. This purchase came with a certificate that acknowledges that I offset one ton of CO2 by financing the planting of this one tree in the Great Rift Valley. As I obsessed about the scope of the scalar geographical material distances between an amount of carbon that more or less equals a return flight between the north and south of Europe, and the years, if not decades, long continuous photosynthesis of a tree being planted in another continent, another perhaps more important set of questions emerged. Who would plant this tree? On what land? The Great Rift Valley is a massive area that cuts through the whole country. Could the planting of this tree be viewed as an occupation of land unknown to me? It further occurred to me that this document that I received, the certificate, may in fact be the product. How certain can I claim that I am one ton of carbon lighter and what implications does that ambiguity have in the increasingly more commonplace scenario of co corporations, even governments, using reforestation and forest conservation programs as carbon mitigation to claim green practices? You see here the area uh, of the tree planting project that I invested in. Uh, so here, amongst other uh, private and corporate customers' trees, mine is also planted. I have a tree in Africa, close to the Ngong Hills. Two decades after Blixen left her settler farm to move back to Copenhagen, this area was the scene of a genocide spurred by an uprising against imperial powers and caused by disputes over land. The Kikuyu people, the largest ethnic group in Kenya, fought for re-access to land that settler occupation had denied them. This is known as the Mau Mau uprising. The backlash that followed from the British colonists Colonist powers would see an estimate of 1.5 million Kikuyu members pass through concentration labor camps, massed as civilization projects that could cost, would cost possibly a hundred thousands of lives. So this image um, is the tree that you saw in the first part of the film. Uh, it's one of the trees that I was told was planted at approximately the time when I purchased the carbon credit. The material, material that I'm showing you is, uh, is collected in February 2020, so it might have grown a little bit by that time, but uh, since that time. Uh, but you can see down here, of course, it's a little bit too tiny for you to see, but uh, it's measured, it's uh, captioned by the, the carbon stock. So, but I'll, I'll go through these images uh, later on. I'll explain a bit more. Um, so this obscure, see. So this obscure purchase and my curiosity towards it forms the original entry point for this project. Uh, this one singular tree mitigating my one ton of CO2 functioning as a case study, a kind of epilogue with unknown outcomes. And as you saw in the video, the project area is lush, green, lots of young seedlings growing, definitely successful at that part of what it's marketed as. Uh, 
Um, this forest is guarded private property and people living adjacent to it are not allowed to use it for livelihood purposes. <coughs> so far, it's proven rather difficult to get in touch with people living nearby uh, who were not working for the project. Uh, so I can't say much about the social impact of this project in particular in this, at this time, but I do still find it reasonable to mention that there are a large and growing number of accounts of, of projects similar to this one, both in Kenya and other East African countries, as well as globally, where what we see is that when an area becomes a conservation or reforestation location, it heavily inflicts on people's livelihoods as they are ultimately banned from using land that they previously have depended on. So these types of offset initiatives are, as to paraphrase um, activist and researcher Jutta Kill, they're being advanced rapidly in spite of an impressive track record of failure. And she also talks about how this type of projects reveals capital's false consideration for some type of high concentration value nature that can be translated into its production system through green economy schemes, like we hear about natural accounting, ecosystem services, offsetting, clean development, and these terms are vague and rather obscure. And as she also says, subject to pick and choose interpretations by vested interests. And in not too few cases, we hear about grave human rights violations relating to their implementation, which is something Elias will talk more about later. So the project has since expanded to look at the processes of the financialization of trees that is happening on a large global scale and where the carbon they are able to absorb is meant to compensate for the consumption of governments and corporations here in the global north, whilst observing how that affects nature and people adjacent to these projects. So Elias was one of the people that helped me to locate this area of the tree planting project that I invested in. Uh, and through him, I was introduced to the issues of Mbubut, which is uh, where he is from. And today, uh, conservation initiatives led by the UN, WWF, the EU, uh, the World Bank, and especially <coughs> a big global project called Red Plus that is heavily invested in by many European countries, um, including a massive contributor, which is Norway, where I'm, I'm originally from, and also the Netherlands. Um, so these are the largest funneling sources of violence towards indigenous Angler population. And one incentive is indeed to open up for selling carbon stored in the trees in Mbubut as offsets. So I, I visited Mbubut in February 2020, and together with Elias documented the traces of the violences that he and other Sengwer have been experiencing. These are photographs among other material that perhaps allude to a forensic character, but more than that, they stand, I think, in stark contrast to the optics of the initiatives that are ultimately causing this violence. So these are quiet images until you know what you're looking at. And that is to me a point on its own that these realities are awfully quiet under the deafening optics of vetted interests. And I think therefore it's necessary to insist that these are not only sites of evidence of violence towards indigenous people, because although many abstractions cloud the situation, these events should be treated, I think, as direct consequences of climate mitigation schemes carried out in favor of granting corporations and governments usually based in Europe a green image. And more than that, a chance actually to keep at the same production levels and life standards with no impact of climate change. Um, and Elias will also explain more on the context of these images later on in his, his part of the talk. How are, yeah, okay. 
to speed up a little bit. Let's see. So I thought I'd give you like, or try to give you a very short uh, run through uh, on what carbon offsetting is. Um, it's a rather complex subject to maneuver, but straight from the horse's mouth, as in Shell, <laughs> who offers their customers to drive completely carbon neutral by sponsoring conservation and tree planting projects around the place by adding a few cents extra per litre of fuel. So every tonne of CO2 that is avoided by uh, or captured by a project carries a unique serial number which is recorded into a registry, although this is actually very difficult to trace and hardly very public. Um, these credits can be traded among governments and businesses in order to achieve carbon neutrality. So these markets are also set up, especially for governments. Uh, the so-called clean development mechanism, for example, was set up so that the so-called Annex One countries or developed countries can invest in developing countries through implementing these types of sustainability projects and thereby achieve their Kyoto targets. Um, and some governments were especially early in showing great interest in building carbon markets through conservation projects in the global north, uh, especially perhaps my country of origin again, Norway, which is one of the bigger funders of these schemes, paying around $350 million a year from the state-owned initiative, which are funds, of course, maybe you guess, uh, retracted from our number one export, which is oil. <laughs> So uh, let's keep to the big oils. The concept of carbon footprints actually dates back to the early 2000s uh, when Brit British Petrol hired a public relation firm to launch a campaign where one could calculate one's carbon footprint and find ways to reduce them, uh, which is obviously uh, a really ingenious <coughs> idea because it places the responsibility of pollution on private consumers and at the same time it makes an oil firm look like they care a lot about climate change. Yeah, so a point to be made here is that both governments and corporations that have shown very, very little interest in cutting their own emissions have shown great interest in carbon mitigation projects. And it really can't uh, be stated enough how this has all to do with optics, seeing that these conservation projects has not been shown to be especially useful actually in mitigating carbon, uh, like stated by Survival International earlier this year. Protected areas increase human suffering and so accelerate the destruction of the spaces they claim to protect. They have no effect on climate change at all and have been shown to be generally poor at preventing wildlife loss. The idea of fortress conservation, that local people must be removed from their land in order to protect nature, is colonial. It's environmentally damaging and rooted in racist and eco-fascist ideas about which people are worth more and can be pushed off their land and impoverished or attacked and killed. Let's see. Uh, how am I with time? Just thinking. 20 minutes. Okay, I think I'll give the word over to Elias now, so I'll skip a few things. Yes. Elias, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, Elin, thank you. And thank you also to the organizers of this event that made it possible for us to present the situation of carbon trading around the world. Uh, as, I, as I was introduced as Elias Kimayo from indigenous and community who are still li who have been living in neighborhood forest and still living uh, up to the moment. So, so first of all, uh, I'll, I would like to tell to tell you through that who are somewhere people and uh, 
their way of life. So, and I'll start by who are the Sengwer people? Sengwer is an ethnic minority forest indigenous people whose traditional lifestyle characterized by hunting and gathering, beekeeping, blacksmith, blacksmith and handcraft etc. We own the land in the forest and plains in and out of Kerangani Hills, conserving the fauna and flora sustainably and peacefully. This is how Sengwer used to live. They own the land in, in plains and uh, up the hills and uh, using it sustainably. We have scattered population of, of that 3,170 in 2009 population and housing census report. The root cause of the root cause of our problems. Kenya became British colony in 1895, leading to possible evictions and display, displacement of members of our community from our central lands in their plains to settle white farmers. Forests to implement discriminatory Preservation policy. So, as Lynn spoke about this, uh, this portrait conservation forest policies, it did not start recently. It started way back when our lands in the plains were taken and also the forests were converted into, converted into a protected areas. Further, we were forced to be assimilated to surrender our identity, customs, tradition traditional lifestyles and economies and the sustainable conserve and the sustainable conservation customer laws. Lastly, they did not give us our land after independence. We have no place to call home. So when we agitate our land rights, so uh, for colonies, what they tried to do was to get us out, out of their land and possibly they they told us to surrender our identity. That was during the time of colonial. So, government of Kenya today, with discriminatory and unconstitutional immediate colonial policy of forest, now Forest Act 2016. You know, after after we got independence of US, uh, the independent Kenya government inherited the forest laws from colonial and they continued with that fortress conservation. So it does not recognize the rights of under scattered as forest indigenous people to live and own lands and territories in the forests and protected areas sustainably. It failed to respect and protect the rule of law by is regarding injective court orders issued by Kenya courts, but continued forceful evictions by banning of houses, malicious damage of properties, arrests, threats, killings in the name of conservation. As you, if you move to this image, this is how Sengwer used to live. Uh, as I said earlier on, sustainably and conserving the environment. This is how we used to live. And the, when now these issues of conservation came in, the policies that were made that we did not participate in formulating of these policies, then uh, in a move to get that, us out of the forest, as you had seen in an earlier image, that KFS came and finds our homes that looks like this one. So, in the second, if you go to the picture, you see KFS now are trying to demolish our houses and burn our houses in a move to get us out of the forest. So, same situation today. Kenya government has in the past reversed us as squatters. In the past place, we were being reversed as squatters, then displaced persons. But when we agitate our land rights and we show that, that this is not right, uh, Embo Forest is our ancestral land, then they went for incriminating terms such as bandits, criminals, catarastalas, militia. Uh, they were saying this in order to warrant brutal forceful evictions in the name of conservation. We are indigenous people. 
there are origin stewards of Emblewood Forest and the entire Kerangan Hills. This is who we are. We are native of the names that the government and their allies are branding us in order to warrant forceful evictions. Forceful eviction service and threats of members of Sangwer community in Emblewood became worse during NRM Natural Resource Management and intention the red plus project funded by World Bank, UNDB, Finnish government, EU, and now WWF uh, and others who are supposed to live in the cold under trees and in caves and makeshift houses in our own, in our own homes, our community land. This is because now when KFS comes uh, and they sustain forceful evictions, we are forced to go and live in caves. Uh, makeshift houses whereby if they come and plan to take it is for us to build that as in order to continue living. So these are these are the issues that were are being subjected day in day out for many years since col colonies came to Kenya. So impacts of evictions. Uh, when eviction happens, uh, we, we, we find ourselves that we are being affected so much. Uh, uh, post the children to drop out of school, exposing to child labor because they don't have home. So they become destitutes. So they go for labor in, out, uh, uh, in farms uh, adjacent to the forest. The girls drop out of school and forced to to all marriages, children, women, and elders subjected to cold weather, leading to high cases of pneumonia diseases, among other related diseases, landlessness in our own ancestral lands, loss of our cultural language and tradition, subjection to cultural ethnocide and extinction. Women are arrested, harassed, and assaulted by carers, destruction of property and household goods and utensils, subjecting their community to abject poverty, fast rate of loss of diversity biodiversity due to state not recognizing and respecting our rich indigenous customary laws and knowledge of conservation. This is the point whereby government misses or their allies who support conservation that uh, some good people are their custodians. We've been living in this, in this environment for many generations and we've been caring. When they came and found our houses, that is their time now, we saw the depletion of our forests, we saw uh, serious human rights violations, people are being killed, others are being arrested. We have, court, we have people now who are still going to court to go and contest about their arrests. We have even a uh, uh, gone also to court in order to contest these possible evictions. Uh, as you can continue seeing these pictures, you can see some of the pictures here whereby we had community schools. If you can go up a line, we had community schools that were banned a long time ago. And uh, yes, so this, it used to be community school. Long uh, in 2014, it was banned, and from that time, it has been worse because we are unable to build like before in around 90s and early 80s. When normally, when they came and banned the houses, we rebuilt it again. So, if you go to second picture, wherever you can see a makeshift house and uh, a newspaper that I filmed on in front of a house, it's a way of trying to demonstrate. Uh, that normally when KFS come and burn us our houses, they normally deny that people are living inside the forest. So whenever they are being told that they tell outside there that there is no one who lives in the forest, and if, if there is anyone that has burned the house, they, have not, they do not burn people's houses. That is why I've been taking magazines in order to prove, because if you see a magazine within that man, then to show in the courts, because normally they challenge us when we come and contest in court that maybe these houses you build them are from different locations of which we are not doing evictions. So, and many others, you can see many makeshift houses down there. You can see an older man living in a cave. If you put 
down a link to where you can see the, 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 the inbox of the way I'm saying people are forced to live in caves like this old man has just met uh, an house inside a cave. So we have also, as we say, that impacts of evictions like uh, threats or killings. You can see one of the photos whereby one of our one of our member was killed in 2018 January, known as Robert Kilotich, who was murdered around this place when he was uh, uh, looking after his livestock, and his photo was stamped here. This is where the community found it. So the in impacts the of evictions, as you go down to the image, whereby now the cedar trees are being destroyed because the custodians somewhere are not given their rights expresses to, 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 to look after the environment. You see kind of destruction start happening to the trees being felled by lockers because they normally say somewhere to own forestry, it is a government forestry. So, and even sometimes caves to keep out permits for people to come and lock trees. But these are the impacts of uh, evictions. So, what we've done as a community is that to demonstrate about this uh, against these evictions is that we've documented our uh, customer bylaws and put it in paper in order for people to read. For example, in this picture, we've been doing what we call participatory mapping of our territories because we know better than the government. We know so nations where support people are supposed to live. We know where beekeeping should have to take place. We know tracing area sharings and all that. That is why we were trying to map out so that to share with government and also their funders to see that we are living in the forest sustainable and against what they are they are thinking that their perception of colonialism, whereby they say to get people out of their forest and not to conserve. So in the picture again, uh, because the project that, uh, that saw us being violated, uh, known as Water Tower Project, so we've been having complaints. It was being funded by EU, so we met complaints and deal human rights uh, officer from Brussels and from Kenya office came and visited us and he found us in our in our homes to come and see what we've been seeing because or against what the KFS were saying that people were out of the forest. So that is it. And also we've been cooperated like we've been doing demonstrations to and in one day in 2019, we walked from member to Nairobi to petition to take petition to the office of the president, of which we were not listened. So I can say also that in this struggle of ours, the people who have been our great allies are people, journalists, artists, researchers, uh, and, and also CSOs. Because as a community, if we don't tell out these issues, what happens in the end of forest, then government will end us whipping us out of the forest without anyone knowing. So we we point our collaboration mostly with journalists and researchers who normally come and see the how the situation is in order to publish for people to understand. And uh, of course, in a recent attempt that, again, we tried to mobilize other indigenous communities because we are about nine indigenous communities who are still residing in the forest and still facing the same threats of evictions. So we formed uh, we formed a movement known as UNGAFO and as Ankatras Forum, whereby we sought to consolidate our voices in order to be heard. So, yeah, also women, uh, had to be introduced in this struggle because men alone could not be, be able to struggle by themselves. Also, the role of women is so important in our community. As you can see, some of them were just uh, demonstrating to show what they are going through. So, hope that is what I can say for now. Back to you, Aileen. Thank you.
It's, um, oh, the time is perfect. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> Leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Elena, and thank you for Elias for um, uh, presenting together in this way as well. I thought that was really incredible. And so um, you're, you're up against this sort of major system of abstractions, right? Like there is um, a carbon offset registry that you can't even access. I mean, the abstraction of like the, the audacity to think of a concept like carbon offsetting in the first place. Um, then there is the sort of full weight of the law and the techn technocracy of the EU and all these partner organizations that are working um, uh, to, to build this project, conservation project. Um, and I thought the example that Elias gave as well of showing the newspapers in order to show that, they're, um, that, that a space is occupied is really strong and there's a real sense of sort of like forensics from the presentation that Elias was also giving, right? Of like, like testifying to what is happening. Um, I was maybe wondering first for Elena, can you talk a little bit about the sort of visual strategies that you employ, especially coming from a background as a photographer mm. um, to, to kind of intervene within these like major structures? or against these major structures. Yeah, so actually that is, I, I was going to show you some uh, some more images, but uh, mm -hmm. time ran out. <laughs> um, so uh, beyond, so, so these images that uh, we showed you, uh, mostly during Elias' talk, um, they, are, they are plain photographs, right? They are uh, um, recordings of these spaces where these, these very like, uh, invisible things have happened. So, and mm -hmm. and they're captioned by 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 what Elias has has written with them. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I think these are kind of very much like testament to the sort of the quietness of this narrative uh, in comparison to these vetted interests. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also. A, applying uh, film, right? Mm -hmm. uh, different types of, uh, of, of shorter film. And of course, I haven't been able to actually produce so much yet because I was, I was there only for, for, for three weeks so far. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is also, of course, like uh, due to limitations on, on, um, on the ability to continue the project also because of, of COVID. Um, and, and you're going to have to buy another carbon offset to fly back to Kenya, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so another thing that I've been interested in has been um, the employment of imaging uh, from, uh, from these, um, like the calculation Imagings of uh, the imaging processes that calculate uh, carbon um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. capture mm -hmm. in forests. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and and I think if you're interested in that, you just have to come up to me because I was uh, I was going to show you it. But so, um, so these are the point clouds that you show exactly, next to the carbon yeah. offsets. Yeah, yeah. And they're a way of representing the way that a carbon offsetting company might. Exactly. Yeah. So that these they are might calculate how much carbon can yeah, be offset. Yeah. So these Sorry, are yeah. based on these kind of um, methodologies of uh, yeah how how carbon uh, capture is measured in forests. Mm. So, um, but also uh, yeah how how these things are kind of um, yeah like very much like kind of. Uh, cut into data, like how nature mm -hmm. is sort of cut into data. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, it's difficult to talk about without showing the images. Yeah, yeah. What, can I uh, ask one more follow-up? What do you mean sure. by nature cutting into data? Because that strikes me as a super interesting little byline right there. I mean, that is the whole process, right, of the uh -huh. financialization of of these trees. Mm. Um, so I was very interested in like how, yeah, like how to kind of look at individual trees as sort of products mm -hmm. that they become in this, in this uh, carbon offsetting market. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. I will 
sneak up to right next to you because I have to take a better position. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, there's no questions on the chat right now from uh, our online audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, one point that was made is that the U.S. Army is apparently one of the biggest carbon offset producers in the entire globe. Mm -hmm. But these again, <clears throat> I think, promote the same thing that you are uh, talking about, Elias and Elina where the access to that information or the gaps in data are the major problem in tackling anything. Um, in Ember with forest. Yeah. That is why even if there is threats that comes with it, but uh, the beautiful part of it is that it gets outside to know what we are going through. So this information is so crucial for us mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it is that is um, us going. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, oh, big audience. It grew. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In the meantime, Elias, our group, uh, group here in the space uh, has uh, become bigger. So we're full house now. Um, but maybe some of the people also missed a part of the story. That's possible. Sorry, I yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, I'm just, uh, I find it remarkable when there, were, there have been repeated forest fires in California, but I remember hearing the one very big one two years ago, possibly. Mm -hmm. Some of them wiped out huge carbon offset plantations, which, uh, wonderfully, for the companies who'd sold all of those trees to people buying carbon offsets, mm. they just got uh, their land wiped clean to start again with selling more shade yeah. and trees for carbon offsets. Yeah. So and this I wondered if there was a different way of personalizing so that you you know you haven't adopted uh, lots of people haven't adopted the same tree mm -hmm. one <laughs> exactly to know the shape of one tree that they have adopted and that tree is going to be identifiably the offset that they bought and if it burns down well they they don't have that offset anymore i don't know i was just thinking of like the, the visual image rather than the location I just have to recap for the online sorry. audience, sorry, uh, that the point is there's a big gap in actually measuring and knowing the people connected to the offset bought trees. Once they, uh, that's our timer, <laughs> once they are purchased, but also when they are burned down, which is maybe a perverse uh, stimulation of, uh, let's say, not keeping care of the, of the forestry uh, burns, uh, burnings. I think the question is then to Elina and Elias, do you feel that there should be some kind of, is there growth to be gained by connecting those dots more precisely? I think this is precisely what they're kind of claiming to do, um, but they're not actually doing this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah, I think my conclusion is that there's no uh, good tree planting project. There just can't be a good tree planting project. It's inherently just basic land grabbing, mm. unless it happens, um, you know, By in the, the Netherlands or so, or, you know, I, yeah. Is there a way for uh, indigenous people, alias, to reclaim the projects that you would be doing in your own uh, ways. The idea is people are missing the point that indigenous, the forests that are existing now is because of indigenous communities. What they are missing is that the cooperatives, the cooperatives who are pumping their money in tree planting uh, are not doing good to our environments. In fact, uh, some plant in fast trees they don't understand this nature that we trees spe species cross uh, cross where, and uh, this is the missing thing that people should have to understand that the real people who are restored and supported to conserve the environment are indigenous communities. You don't have to. You don't need money. You don't go much. Get a little activation. Our next video will be screened from the space next door, which is normally our exhibition space. So you're kindly asked to join Lua and the rest of our colleagues over there for the screening of a work by Tabitha Rezer.
Hello, my friend. I'm good and you. Oh, actually, I'm not good. Yes, it's this internet thing, this Facebook thing. Yes, you know. No, my friend, it's like I've posted something about the white people saying that they should give our land back, you know. Yes. And they've banned me for, from Facebook. Can you believe it? Idiot or something like that, I don't know. This is racism on a, on a serious note. This is really not good. It's like they are not treating us equally. They are not treating us like human beings. <laughs> oh, my friend, you know this data thing? They, they really need to fall in you know? Yes, because we are wasting our money buying data instead of buying cold drink and dress or uh, bread or something like that, you know. Electronic colonialism is the domination and control of digital technologies by the West to maintain and expand their hegemonic power over the rest of the world. Saabad warned us in 1995 when he wrote, The West desperately needs new places to conquer. When they do not actually exist, they must be created. Enter cyberspace. Electronic colonialism is one of the many ways in which colonial domination survived after its defeat. While settler colonialism was the policy and practice of acquiring, controlling, occupying, and economically exploiting land and labor, which by the way is still a thing, it's just now called capitalism, electronic colonialism seeks to influence and control the mind through the digital device. It also operates by sustaining the dependency of former colonized countries on the West by the importation of hardware, software, engineers, technicians, and information protocols. This creates a set of foreign norms, values, and expectations that alter and marginalize local cultures, languages, habits, values, and lifestyles in favor of Eurocentric knowledge. Many countries in the Global South have become electronic colonies that are force-fed information generated by the Western world. Under the guise of globalization, the information revolution has become a vehicle for cultural westernization. The internet is exploitative, oppressive, exclusionary, classist, patriarchal, racist, homophobic, transphobic, fatphobic, homophobic. State of the art cable installation takes us through the initial takes phase, us through the initial of phase of a landing operation. landing operation, cloud deployment, cloud deployment, of a burial fiber or subgrade fiber optic cable.
the perpetrators of slavery and colonialism tried and still try to defend and justify themselves with the civilization mission rhetoric. We brought culture and modernity to the savages, pretending their new trade routes were connecting the world. In reality, all they did was to steal land, massacre indigenous populations, exploit their resources and workforce to increase the wealth of their empires. Same stories with the internet. Multimedia giants claim we are connecting people to each other, while underneath they steal and exploit our data, our free labor to increase the wealth and power of their media empires.
it's one thing to have rain it's one thing to have water it's one thing to have appropriate water clean water when rain water falls especially the first rain there's all there's there are already pollutants in the atmosphere so they wash it down it falls on the roads it sits from the roads it sits along it carries dirt that's still pollution isn't it it carries oil it carries everything that you have in the along its path water carries everything along its path water is not as the way it used to be because of industrialization um we like industrialization we want everybody wants life easy what what industrialization has is aimed at is making life easy or quicker um so we have cars to go here quickly we don't walk so we have um, washing machines to wash our plates we don't even want to wash them we want the best convenience we want um you know things to be done well there is a cost it takes off the natural it takes off what you're supposed to get naturally and, and to me that's that's the price you pay because all what we call pollutants or so you see in wastewater you see in in domestic water on hospital everything which is there is something that has been man-made But what I believe is that water is holy when you pray for it, and it makes us to bring out living water. It makes our voice, to our sound, to be something that can cleanse. You get it? Our actions to cleanse, our life to cleanse, you know, to, 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 to be alive. They speak much more than just ordinary things. You know, whenever water passes somewhere, it leaves a trace. There's no way you can put water somewhere without the trace. Every single person has a responsibility. And if that consciousness of the fact that whatever I do now affects my tomorrow, and your tomorrow is not what just necessarily what belongs to you, but there's a generation coming ahead. You know, what, what every little effort you make now affects generations ahead. Affect not just when it has to deal with water, it doesn't just affect people, it affects the soil, it affects the ground, it affects the plant, and it's it's a whole life circle. That out of you will flow rivers of living water. Dino Kalubri Modewe Ka change mo la vie. Qui sa noté que fait sans de l'eau, dit l'homme au contente. Vous qu'à admirer ta force, parce nous savez faux panga. Mais là, la to lisse, to belle, lisse goutte le monde. Pour arriver sa hule, Dieu va seulement n'y a qu'un grand nom. À la beauté de la Guyane, traverse et prix, prix rivière. À la beauté de la Guyane, traverse et prix, prix rivière. Dis-le, 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 qu'à l'ouvrir, mon déwe, qu'à changer mon la vie. Qui sa noté, qui fait son de l'eau, dis-le, mon contento. In some countries in the world, you are terribly missing. In Esopia, Biafra, many children are dying. But we hope a day you'll come, then you'll be there to save them. And people will be happy, and people will be singing. And people will be happy, and people will be singing and dancing too. L'ouvri mot de wé, qu'a changé mot la vie. Qui sa noté, qui fait son dlo, dit le mot contento. Dit le mot contento. Dit le mot contento.
Welcome online audience. You'll be watching a film by Natalia Sliwinska called Beyond Taxonomic Narratives, and it will run for about 21 minutes. The past composed of objects suspended in the present. A pool of possessions, formally collected, classified, studied, catalogued and indexed. Locked in displays objects, their hidden histories. How to address them. How to read between the lines. How to approach histories that go beyond the context of our own belonging. As I'm not a taxonomist, I'm interested in the story and often the story is not there. Most of the people who look at the species, they're happy the species is there, so they can do their thing with it. When I was um, in Leiden, I found out that there was a room with uh, useful plant products, and there was also a large fiber collections. And then I saw the Panama heads, and I also saw the um, instructions with all the different patterns woven on it. And then I found some photographs of the Maria Patronaat in Suriname, where young girls had to uh, leave these Panama heads. And then I found out that it was a Catholic boarding house where young girls, either uh, unwanted, pregnant, or had misbehaved in the eyes of the Catholic Church. They, they were, I don't know, I wouldn't say locked up, I don't know, because the only information that we have is from the Catholic Church that they would give them a better, decent future. And they had to leave Panama heads so they could learn the skill. Coming across the Panama Hat story was accidental. I contacted Professor Van Andel while researching lost plant stories. That's when she told me about the Tequila Palm Fiber, the place it occupies in the collections of Naturalis, how it is used to make Panama hats, and the connection with the Maria Patronat Braiding School in Suriname. I tried to reach out to women of Surinamese descent to find out if they knew anything about this particular story, but without success. It may seem that a natural history museum only stores a plant, which for most biologists exists as one of many specimens in their collections. Yet the example of Panama Hat's story shows this isn't just a plant but a story of most likely incarcerated women and girls. I've been collecting all these uh, objects and books and works of art for the last uh, 25, 30 years, I guess. I still find new stories I did not know by going through my books. Sometimes I travel in my own library and I find stories that I had not uh, heard of before. It's a strange phenomenon, but the books are written, they're printed, but of course, 100 years later, the knowledge contained in the book is no longer in our general knowledge. We, we have forgotten this, so we have to keep on digging in archives and in books to uh, come up with stories and information. I think that our identities are formed by stories. You would say that the stories that you uh, that, that are being told are true, but in fact, stories, you know, can also vary in every perspective. I mean, even at school, when you get to hear uh, some history stories, for example, you start to believe everything that they say. Actually, you don't know who you are until other people tell you stories about you that you were not aware of. Every story actually brings you to new questions. Every story brings you to another story. Every story is a fragment of a whole. Every story is once a fragment and a whole. 
History is often presented as a linear sequence of events, where those marked important are preserved on a timeline. In that way, timelines situate events, putting objects and people in the right place. This rigid way of ordering history replaces people's place in the world previously shared with others. It cuts their roots with the past and disconnects the links with their history from which they draw strength and inspiration to move forward. This yet uniform nature of passing on and preserving knowledge continues to keep unreported stories alike the Panama hat out of sight, presenting only one perspective, one timeline, one story. How often is that the frameworks of classification systems hold us from looking behind the labels? They shift our attention from all the interconnected timelines of objects, stories and people. Can we reimagine archival material in such a way that it's located within multiple timelines? Archival material which conveys collective histories, lives and memories. When we acknowledge, retell and preserve these various unreported stories, how can we contribute without reproducing the same dominant narrative? I would ask myself what would be the, the purpose of retelling this story? How can I make this story or uh, what elements can I find in this story which are relevant to tell uh, now? I think telling a story is a responsibility and that's why it's 50-50. So I think your purpose is how you fill in the way you tell your story. I think my question would be how can I make the amount of information that is left from this story, how can I make it relevant today? What's in there that we can learn, that, that we can learn from? I'm not only interested in the plant itself, I'm always interested in the story behind it. Um, that's why I started studying these old collections. What is stored in our institute as a fiber under the name C of Carlo de Vica Palmata, um, it's only the fiber name. You, can, you cannot find the story behind that if you look in our archive. And it's only one story. I mean, we have an enormous collection. There is a longer story about many of these plants that can be told, should be told. Panama hats are beautiful, but there's a very sad, I think there's a very sad story behind it. And I think the women who have woven these hats are no longer alive because it happened in the 1920s. So they were 15 then, so. But there must be uh, daughters, granddaughters, uh, ch grandchildren who must have heard these stories from their uh, grandparents. And those stories have never been written down. The history is not always nice. But it's not something you should cover, because then you will never learn. Nobody will ever learn from it. In my case, I would say everyone can, you know, contribute to tell the story, but it needs to be carefully done. And uh, it can absolutely not happen without uh, the people uh, who are directly affected by it. So for me it's constantly an exchange. It's constantly an exchange and it's like this is it has everything to do with ethics. It's especially important to to tell various stories of one event. And by showing all these different stories together, you get a sort of, I wouldn't say complete, but you get a, a more complete um, story um, of, of history. And I have some friends who always tell me that they want to rewrite history. And, uh, you know, the problem with history is that we cannot 
We cannot change it. What's history is history. We can only change the way we look at it and the stories we tell um, about that history. If we look at the Dutch colonial history in Suriname, we have been for two, three hundred years, we have been looking at the history from uh, top down. We have been looking at who was the governor, who was important, etc., etc. But we have now, the last ten years, we've been become more interested in uh, in the stories of everyday people, every you know, everyday life of normal, ordinary people who were servants or who were working in the plantation. Once harvested, the tequila straw is peeled, opened, cut and dried. The quality of a Panama hat is defined by the tightness of the weave. Most hats take about a day to make, while some take weeks or even months to complete. These traditional hats of Ecuadorian origin have been produced all over South America. Originally used by farmers, they became popular in the mid-19th century to eventually come to be an expensive fashion accessory amongst Westerners. We are far from knowing the full scope of the story and what really happened at the Maria Patronat Braiding School. The only information that is left comes from the institution itself. Most of it resonates with the imposed Christian facade of morality, where punishment and labour were more likely seen as a way of redemption for these women. There is a lot of silence which speaks through the only remaining photographs from the Maria Patronat. It is challenging to imagine the real conditions these women were subjected to on a daily basis. And yet this is the only truth, one side of the story, which continues to give even more authority to the institutional body. The dominant narrative from the Maria Patronat Braiding School continues to segregate lives into significant and unimportant. In this narrative, only certain memories exist and continue to be remembered. The story also became something personal to me. I realized how it reminded me of my early upbringing, in which Christianity played a big part, and how it reveals this particularly vile side of the institution which some of my family members still support. It also became my access point in reflecting on how to relate with similar unreported stories. The conversation I had with a member from the Black Archives yet made me realize how each of these unreported stories hold painful memories. How difficult it is for the people affected to re-engage with them. How then can we retell painful stories without further opening up these wounds? You mentioned the word pain and, and, and the painful stories. If it's um, the pain uh, stopping you from exploring that history, you are um, you're not helping history to be uh, documented and to be told. So you have to overcome that, um, if you can, to, uh, to look at these sources in a, in a relatively rational way. There is no limit to what we should document and what we should, we should tell all the stories, and especially the stories that have not been told. And that, when it comes to Shurnam, that is especially the stories of the people who have not been heard, the people who have not been writing down things, basically, because everything you see here is, of course, a reflection of the European perception of that history. I think you can, you know, so asking yourself this position, who am I and who am I to tell this story, that's always good, because it has to do with ethics. You want to, you, you want to make sure that this story will not be retold in a negative way but it's something that you constantly have to be in dialogue with and find actually your, your tools, you know, of, of um, find your tools of 
okay, this is what it means to me then. Find a way how to make it relevant for now. Like people like you, maybe you can make it relevant for the people who, who can identify with you, who can, who can identify with your story. How uh, could this process be relevant for us who are looking for ways to um, retell a story? I think it was the, uh, the, the head of the history section in the Rijksmuseum who said in 2015 that we have to uh, come to terms with our colonial past. We, ca we cannot look away anymore. So that was an important, uh, an important step, but that's only six years ago. So, you know, we're just starting to explore our uh, colonial history when it comes to uh, the West Indies and to, to Suriname. And of course, we have to make sure that we don't live in the, let's say, the fat years now talking about this colonial history and 10 years from now, nobody is talking about it anymore. And I think, therefore, that collectors, private collectors, me, you, all of us, have a special role to play. We should not leave it to uh, institutions only because at this moment, History has become uh, political. Whatever government we have 10 or 20 years from now, if it's going to be an extreme right-wing government, for example, trying to, not, to deny this history, there should be enough uh, private individuals, uh, private collectors to uh, document this history. These people are there, but they're hidden behind the labels, you can almost say. so. When you open up, you let other people who have the skills trace that history. Institutes like Kew Gardens, they're already so far ahead. They digitize the archives, they put them there, and they invite social scientists and historians and, and humanities people and whoever, migrant communities, to tell their story on the base of their collection. They have now broadened their scope and, and, and welcome very much uh, people also from the countries of origin to study and and their collections and tell their specific story. And I think that's the way we should do that as naturalists too. What are the elements that are meaningful for today's society? Um, and then um, who is directly affected by this story? Can I still find these people? Are there still voices, you know, that want to tell this story but didn't find or didn't have a platform? for it yet. I think that would be my first question, my first questions and also that's how I would start my research. Okay, what's in there that's so specific and so meaningful that can help look back at history in a different way? Um, and it can make a difference for how we continue in the future. The Panama Hut story in the end became my journey. A learning process while being in a conversation with others. It made me understand there are no such things as invisible stories. I wasn't discovering anything. Stories are not in need of discovering nor are hidden. I was only uncovering a secret. And these secrets are known far beyond the archive but often forgotten. The Panama Hat story is just one recent encounter, which could only take place because of one person and their willingness to look closer, behind the labels. But many similar stories are still hidden in the drawers, waiting to be heard. As an artist and a maker, I feel I have a responsibility to respond. To find a different language for describing the world. To find out ways of intervening in these prevailing narratives. To find courage to imagine otherwise. Change can only take place if it involves a different approach. It is not about turning back from the Western perspectives, but decentering them. Acknowledging the need to re-inscribe in the present 
the other ways of living, doing and thinking. In this way, we come back to reaffirm histories which are currently being denied or erased. We all have an important role to play in caring for the history. After all, it concerns all of us and the future we wish to create for ourselves and others. Thank you everybody for staying put and uh, you're back at the Uncertainty Seminars live from the headquarters in the set by the Rodina. Uh, our online audience uh, just saw some videos, uh, one video, uh, but our offline audience here packed in the space have noticed their chairs were shifted by the time they came back from Tabitha Rezer's screening. And that is because we are uh, landed at the last element of our program tonight and it's a video, newly commissioned video, uh, uh, sorry, a newly commissioned performance artwork uh, by Claudio Rittfeld. He is uh, presenting a, a second part of a work called Identification Obligation. This is part two, and it will take about 30 minutes. Enjoy the show.
Wow. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I'm back on. Thank you uh, tremendously, Claudio Ritveld and performers uh, Eva, Daniel, and Boris. Uh, we'll link their names on socials if you want to know more. Thank you so much. Um, yes, one round of applause. <laughs> Uh, this is the end of our uh, official program. We've landed at the uh, outer skirts of the program in uh, chronological terms. And that means that we're going to give a big round of thanks um, first to some people uh, outside of our organization that oh, have yeah. come in. Yes. Thank you to everyone joining the conversation online. Uh, the recording of this live stream without the video wax will appear on YouTube. Uh, thank you to the audience here in the flesh, in The Hague. It was an absolute joy to be in a space again uh, with some of you who could join here. Uh, we very much hope to repeat that shortly. Uh, and obviously you're shortly rewarded with dinner uh, for your physical presence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> An incredible thanks to uh, our contributors of today. So Open Weather, Tabita Rizer, uh, Shannon Matten, uh, Alina Benjaminson and Elias Kimayo uh, and today's performers. Uh, and I'd l just like to thank our funders too, the Council of the Hague and the Mondrian Fund. This event would never have been possible without our fantastic team. Of course, this looks and feels a little bit like a studio. That is the great work of Stefan Bandelak and team. Big thank you to them. Big thank you to everybody uh, on the team at Strom, Michelle. Marike, Johan, Lisbeth, Hill, Annegien, and everybody else um, that always supports our events. Uh, please keep an eye out on our social media channels and our website so that you can stay posted of the very full program that we have immediately started planning upon uh, recovering from our <laughs> corona time. So our fall is pretty packed at Strom, so we recommend keep up this uh, spirit as an audience and please return to us soon. Next week we have an opening by Kevin Osepa. Uh, more than welcome to stay uh, tuned on that. Uh, for now I'd like to give a warm thanks once again to uh, everybody for watching, everybody for contributing. Um, we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>one last thing dinner should be out soon there's also a program of screenings for museum night of five kabika alumni who i believe are among us yes. so very happy see you all soon